Hi, my name is Heidi Totten, and I'm the Marketing Director for Wisdom Window, and I am so excited to introduce my guest today. This is Marianne Johnson, and she is the homeschool coach. Hi, Marianne. How are you? Hi, Heidi. I'm good today. Good. Good. Well, I'm so excited that you were able to come in today, and I'm really excited about your content up on Wisdom Window and the things that you're doing. Um, you have been, you homeschooled your seven children, correct? Actually, the last two, so I've been on both sides of that fence. Oh, perfect. Okay, yeah. so you, but you have been working with homeschoolers for many years. Yes. 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 Lots and, of moms, lots of dads. Yes, and and Marianne's a little bit famous in the homeschool <laughs> circle. Um, everyone that I've talked to, if I say, "Oh, do you know the homeschool coach Marianne Johnson?" Johnson it, literally, "Oh, yes, I love her stuff." So, oh, that's nice. Yeah. So, tell us a little bit about your history. Tell us your story of how you, um, because when you homeschooled your last two, it was a little bit less mainstream than it is now. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, my uh, one of my children started struggling in middle school, and I just thought, Oof, and I couldn't make headway there. I I was friends with the principal for goodness sakes. You'd think I, you know, could have gotten some help, and and it just wasn't a very good situation. And I just decided I'm done with that. And so I decided to homeschool the last two. One was in fourth grade, and one was um, not even in school yet. Mm. And so. Um, in where I lived in Montana, there were no resources at all, and I only knew one other homeschool mom. And frankly, up until that time, I thought she was pretty weird. <laughs> you know, you just—it it, just—it never occurred to me to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but we became really good friends. Uh, we ran a facilitation home a facilitation school for homeschoolers mm -hmm. three days a week for a few years, which was kind of fun. And then. Um, I learned a lot about homeschooling. I learned uh, that I wasn't doing it very well. But you know, um, my son eventually in 10th grade did go back to public school and he just went right in. And it wasn't a problem. It wasn't a problem. He was still an AB student. He did just fine. And then I homeschooled my youngest daughter until um, 11th grade. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she just went right in. And so, and I didn't have any kind of systems or curriculum or anything. I was really flying by the seat of my pants. Then I moved to Utah and of course my oldest daughter homeschools her children and um, I started meeting a lot of uh, parents through her and um, started seeing some needs as far as inspiring children mm -hmm. and so created what's now called the Spark Station which mm -hmm. is a really fun educational tool that literally makes kids want to learn things. Um, but as I uh, began working with parents on that tool, I realized that its greater um, purpose was connection. Mm. It helped parents connect with their children and that took me in a whole new direction. Mm -hmm. And now I spend a lot of time teaching parents how to enjoy their children more, how to make and find time in their lives for, for their children truly on how to be present, and, and what inspiring a child looks like, uh, and how do you know what kids are interested in. So mm -hmm. I do all that. I um, talk a lot about other things, too, that help parents um, just have more joy in the whole process of parenting. Um, how do you make change, and what does that actually look like, and how do you stop beating yourself up, and how do you stop telling you know, really bad stories about yourself and your kids, mm -hmm. and you know, just all that kind of stuff. So it's morphed a bit. But uh, it's it's been really fun. I met a lot of wonderful moms and dads. Well, it, it, tell us some of the things that um, that you tell parents when they come to you, because I know you have a mentoring program. You also have your Spark Station packets and your entire program. So if somebody comes to you and they say, you know, what are the things I need to know about homeschool? I I'm just as a to back up a little bit. I've been homeschooling for two years now. And in the last several weeks, especially as school's gotten out, I've had friends call me right and left saying, all right, I'm going to homeschool next year. How do I get started? And, you know, um, my process was, oh, tons of research. I mean, I was just searching, 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 searching. <laughs> And then um, I thought, oh, we'll set up desks and we'll set it up and it'll look like school. And then that just totally went out the window. And 
<laughs> and so, um, so, so I wish that I had known you when I was getting started in homeschool. And I remember finding you, you know, and then meeting yes. you later. But uh, what would be if I came to you and I said, okay, I'm going to start homeschooling? What would you tell me? Because I have a lot of friends that are asking that exact question right now. Well. I admit that there are a lot of things in homeschool I don't deal with. Like I don't deal with any legislation or, or what are the laws and rules. Mm -hmm. And I don't do a lot with curriculum. But I have huge resources for that. And so the first thing I do with parents is find out, you know, where their mindset is as mm -hmm. far as school. Um, if curriculum really matters to them, um, I have somewhere I can send them so they can uh, pick the brains of parents who also use curriculums. Mm -hmm. but, um, and then there are a few groups, online groups, that um, I send people to merely because they can ask any question and get dozens of answers mm -hmm. from parents who are in the trenches currently homeschooling. So I, I make sure that um, if people need resources other than mine, I want them to have those resources. But Currently now, for example, or a couple of uh, the people that I'm mentoring, um, their issues are, I feel like a failure, I feel like I'm not doing enough, I feel like my kids are, you know, I'm going to ruin them in some way, and I deal a lot more with that, and I um, help parents understand if their goals are realistic, and a lot of times they're not. Moms are pretty hard on themselves. Um, we do a lot of work on personal change. Uh, we do a lot of work on um, what do children really need and want from their parents, and it's usually more about time and presence mm -hmm. than it is anything else. And then how do they do that? So, for example, I'll just give you an example. So I have one mom who um, she just feels overwhelmed and her calendar is really stretched, and sometimes she goes to bed at night and says, oh, I just didn't get anything important done today. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even think I you know, hugged my child. And I've been there. I know what that feels like. And so I just gave her two little things to practice for the next few weeks. Um, two ways that she can connect with her children without having to carve out a ton of time. So when I was parenting, I was told, well, you know, take every child for a half an hour a week on their own time. Well, I had seven of them. I said, That's a really? lot of hours. <laughs> it's a lot of time. <laughs> it's just not realistic. So I try to come up with solutions for parents that are realistic. So I said to her, I'm going to teach you about mini conversations and um, random physical touch. Mm. So it, for an example of a mini conversation, I said to her, so your 11-year-old boy is draped over the couch. It's a summer day. He's totally bored. And he's been bugging you. Oh, that sounds like my life. <laughs> yes. And as you're walking through the living room and he's draped over the couch, you drape yourself right next to him. Mm -hmm. And you just don't do anything but sit there for a few minutes. And then you pat his knee or his shoulder and say, nice sitting with you. <laughs> and you get up and leave. Mm -hmm. And your 11-year-old is going to go, what? But after you do that, you know, once a day for, for three or four weeks, the next time you drape or over him, he's going to move over a little bit, mm -hmm. and and the conversation might start. So I just say random touch with children is really valuable. It just you can't buy what it will give you, mm -hmm. and you don't plan it. But when you see an opportunity, somebody's doing the dishes, they're really ticked off at you because that's not what they want to be doing. Mm -hmm. Their backs kind of you know. You grab a dish towel. You go next to them. Of course, everybody uses their dishwashers, or you help them load, and you just do it. You don't have to say one word to them. Mm -hmm. You just do it for a few minutes, and then they say, "Nice working with you." It's that little touch, mm -hmm. and off you go. There's no explanation. You, it's random. We um, uh, we call them drive-by snuggles. There you go. That's a <laughs> wonderful term. Kids come in. I grab them, hug them, send them on their way. And you do it not just when they're good mm -hmm. or that they've done something nice. It, it, it has to be just random. Off, you may have had a fight two minutes earlier, mm -hmm. um, but any time you can just see the opportunity to uh, touch or just sit next to a person and not say one word. And then many conversations are really fun. Um, let's take our seven, same 11-year-old boy draped on the couch mm -hmm. board you plop yourself down next to him and you say any random thing that comes into your head. And the more random, the better. For example, you know, when I was 11, I hated red socks. 
<laughs> and then you don't say another word. Mm -hmm. They will either respond or not. And if they don't, it's okay. You just you just sit there, contemplate for three, four, five seconds, and then you say, "Gotta go," and and off you go. Mm -hmm. It's it's a mini conversation. It can they don't even have to respond. A mini conversation might look like this. You can do it with any age. I did it with my three year old grandson. We happened to be out in the yard, and I saw some balloons. Some child had mm -hmm. lost, and there they were going. And I said to him, look at those balloons. He said, cool. I said, what do you think makes them float up there like that? I don't know. I said, you know what it is. It's a gas called helium. Cool. That was the whole conversation. It's a moment of connection with another person. And they're random. Um, one more example. So I call it the three-minute presence exercise. And moms will tell me it sounded so easy, but it's so hard. It's because simple things are not always the easy things, but they are simple and they really work. So this is an example of if, if you're having trouble connecting with your children, you can do this every day. It takes three minutes. So you're calling your kids in to brush their teeth. Maybe you've got two or three or four of them in the bathroom. And instead of doing what you usually do, herd them in there, say, come on, it's time for bed, let's get going. And you're trying to do other things. You pop yourself down on the toilet. And you watch them brush for, brush for a few seconds, and then you say, this is what I would say, because this is what happened to me. You know, when I was in third grade, they showed a movie about brushing your teeth. And there was this little black guy that was running around on our teeth called Lacty. Scared the dickens out of me. <laughs> and then you just don't say anything. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> kids anywhere from nine and down will usually say, what'd they do that for? That's really gross or that would scare me too. And now you have a conversation going at last during the toothbrushing time and then you're done. It's three minutes of actual connection where you're looking at someone, you're talking to them, you're not thinking about my favorite show is coming on in five minutes, mm -hmm. um, I sure need a break. I can't wait to get them to bed. I had so much laundry. Whatever it is that usually rolls around in your head mm. takes practice. But if you did that once a day, the dividends are huge, huge, huge. I um last week and and I actually posted about this on Facebook. My almost eleven year old son <laughs> said, "Mom, how do you make a smoothie? Will you make me a smoothie?" And I said, "You can make a smoothie. You've seen me make a smoothie over and over and over again." And um. And so he said, well, teach me how to make a smoothie. I said, okay, put in, you know, see the number two on the, you know, on the blender. And I said, fill that up with either water or milk. Now throw in a banana, scoop of protein powder, frozen fruit. So he made it and he was very proud of himself. And he was like, oh, look, we'll taste it, mom. Make sure it's okay. So I tasted it. And this morning... I heard the blender going. I mean, he's been making smoothies for himself every morning, but so I heard the blender going. And honestly, this is my thought. I thought, I hope he's making me a smoothie <laughs> now that he knows how. <laughs> and, you know, because I was running late. And anyway, it was hilarious. So he comes upstairs and he made one for me and he made one for his sister. And he was very like, is it okay? How does it taste? Because I did it exactly like you told me to. And I, and I tasted it and I said, oh, it's great. He said, well, you know what, Mom? When life hands you lemonade, make lemonade. And when life hands you smoothie ingredients, make smoothies. That's how I, you know, like that's my philosophy or whatever. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and as long as he's making me smoothies, I'm not going to correct him on the lemons and lemonade thing. That's right. It's too cute. And that was a moment of connection. When you stopped what you were doing and you showed him how to do that, instead of saying, oh, I'll show you later or... I don't have time right now, or I'd rather do it. I'll do it for you. Right. That was a true moment of connection. And then he came and connected back to you. Mm -hmm. And not only did he connect back with you, you had a mini conversation. Right. And these are really, they're powerful tools that, but most um, moms have to practice them because we're out of the habit of talking with one another and we're way too busy. Mm -hmm. We're way too busy. Um, I teach five rules of connection and Simplicity happens to be number three. <laughs> Presence mm -hmm. is number one. You know, things that you can do, they're simple things, but we have to be reminded. Um, most moms have to be reminded that they aren't failing. Mm -hmm. There are just other things they can do. And they have to be things that are doable time-wise. Mm -hmm. 
you know, when you've got four or five children, let's get real. Yeah. <laughs> Life's chaotic. It's true. So. Well, life's chaotic, chaotic with two sometimes, <laughs> yes, and is. all the neighbor kids that seem right. to come over. So, um, I, you know, as far as my, you know, my day, the way that I map out my day, I, I'm realizing that I kind of unschool more than I homeschool. That um, we take advantage of learning situations as they come, and it's more like learning through life experiences. Um, they do math every day and they do language arts, but everything else, it's it's like you said with the balloons. I mean, that was a science lesson. It's helium. Science. It, science doesn't have to be a curriculum. Science can be an experience. Oh, what makes the the leaves green? Well, let's go look that up. You know, I, I mean, little things like that. But um, also finding that reading is a big deal. That even just reading with my kids it, it makes that connection so much stronger. And so. So when you're talking about simplicity, what are like three things that you can say, if I do this every day, five minutes of reading or, you know, these things, that that's going to move me ahead and, and help me feel as a mom like I've really connected? Mm -hmm. Well, reading would be really top on my list because when it's done well, it's so fabulous. And so I will... Um, so I learned the hard way that <clears throat> we have this picture in our mind of all of our children, you know, neatly sitting and reading and this, you know, warm fuzziness that happens. <laughs> and that isn't really how it looks. How it looks is different for every family. For example, I have one mom who, in order to engage her children with reading, um, they're all on the floor in various stages of, uh, you know, reclining and they all have something in their hands um, one might and they have to be uh, nonverbal activities where they don't need any help so her three-year-old might be stringing beads and somebody else might be drawing a picture or coloring in a coloring book and I've had people say well then they're not getting it yeah they are they are they're getting the story but more than that the warm fuzzy does happen mm -hmm. and I, I have a mom now who has some children who are really um, out of control. Mm -hmm. um, they've had some upheavals in their family and, and their children are responding to that and there's a lot of upheaval. So I suggested her that she start reading to them. And so what they did and the suggestion that I gave her just because of their situation is they all get in the middle of her bed and they just have their pillows and they just bunch up in this bunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she has a couple of really rambunctious boys. Um, with AD, mm, ADD. ADD. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's a little bit challenging. And so she did that for um, like three days, and then fell off the wagon because it's an issue of becoming consistent and really enjoying something that isn't exactly how you picture it in your mind. Mm -hmm. And then she didn't do it for a few days, and her boys, her rambunctious boys who don't read and are difficult to handle, came to her with the book and said, "When are we going to read?" Mm. That's how powerful it is, and it doesn't take very long. And so her complaint was, "Well, it doesn't it it doesn't last very long." I said, "How long does it last?" And she said, "10 to 15 minutes." And I said, "That's the time frame." <laughs> yeah. She said, "Oh, I thought we should read for you know 45 minutes to an hour." And I just said, "No, no, no, oh. no. If you can read with your kids for 10 minutes, it, that's wonderful." I found with my daughter, um, my son is a little bit better, but with my daughter, if she's not coloring while we're reading, she not paying attention at all. That's right. She has to have something to focus on in order to listen. And if if I let her do that, if I have something else there and she's just listening in the background, she's picking up everything and can repeat everything that I've said. Everything. So, and yeah. and I always read up. So if I have a group with say a two year old, a five year old and an eight year old, um, we'll read up mm -hmm. more to the eight year old level. Yes. Because the two year old's in your lap just snuggling mm -hmm. usually and the five-year-old's coloring and the eight-year-old is you know looking at baseball cards or whatever he's mm -hmm. doing during that time and you you think they're not going to get it because you don't normally read a book for an eight-year-old to a two-year-old but I'm just I've just had too much experience that it really works so one good um, story so I had a daughter who really struggled in high school during those years and she was one of my public school kids. 
and and really kind of separated from our family. She was in and out. Sometimes we didn't know for sure where she was. It was just a difficult time for her, difficult time for us. But I was homeschooling the last two at that time. Mm. And um, so every night we just would get on my bed and we would read. And sometimes she'd show up and she'd lean against the door frame like this for, I don't know, five or ten minutes. Mm -hmm. And then should be off. Well, she is almost, um, she's thirty. going to be 38 this year. And last year she said to me, you know, Mom, the thing I remember most is you reading to us. I'm thinking I never read to her. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have that down then. But just the little bit she participated with, with these other two, it's powerful. It's just hugely powerful. So, powerful. so number one, I'd say read. And Father's reading is even more powerful than mother's reading. Mm -hmm. Fathers will do the reading so mother can do snuggling. That's a tremendous um, team sport. <laughs> well, we when we first started homeschooling, um, we were trying to get my son was eight at the time, and we were trying to get him excited about reading, and so we read Fable Haven, and my husband read Fable Haven with my son every night, and they read all of the series, and it, it was by the end of that. My son was literally like picking up books and just reading them on his own. And now he's carrying around, you know, he's ten and a half. He's carrying around huge, thick books and reading all these series. He's read all of Harry Potter, all of the. He can't read enough. We can't keep him in books. And so, um, so my husband was stressing a little bit about over my daughter and saying she's not really reading on her own. And I said, well, you know. He didn't do it till he was eight. I mean, yeah. kids choose. Well, now she's starting to, because we're starting to read with her um, more and more. We've always read with her, but now she's hit the age where she's starting to become more curious. And so she's reading more and more. And so we decided this summer we would have a family book that we would just read together. And we would read a chapter a night, you know, a few nights a week. But it's something that we're, it's 59 chapters, so that will take us the summer. Um, and so I read the first night, and then I was gone the other night, and um, texted my husband and said, what are you doing? He said, we're reading the family book. And I was like, perfect. So establishing those little routines, whether mom's home or not, whether dad's home or not, you still just jump in and do it for the 10, 15 minutes that it takes to read a chapter. Yeah, and another thing that I tell moms that's high on my list for homeschooling moms or any mom is consistency. So you you just said it. So all children really thrive with structure. We don't think they do, but they really do want to know what's coming. Yes, they what do. is coming? And I tell parents it's an issue of trust. Mm. Um, your children have to be able to trust you. If you say we're going to do this, then do it. And and I always teach too that um, structure has to be within a flexible flexible parameters and I have moms will say well how can you have structure and be flexible well because that's how families are mm -hmm. so for example you're gonna read every night somewhere between six and nine but you're gonna read every night right. but if you say we're gonna read at eight o'clock every night then half the time you're not gonna read mm -hmm. because something will happen that will get in the way so there has to be flexibility it's the same with doing homeschooling if you say okay our family learning time is gonna be you know Eight o'clock in the morning after chores. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't happen. It's not. Ha it's not happening. <laughs> it's it's not just happening. not happening. Yeah. But if you say we're going to have family learning time for two hours every day, sometime between nine and noon, you're going to hit it almost every day. I kind of say sometime between the time you wake up and the time you go to bed, yes. you'll learn something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll do something, but, but we've, we've found that um, letting it be, I, I mean, my kids love lists. They love to follow lists, and I don't love to make lists. I'm not a check, check, check. I, I know many people who are, but I'm not that type of person, but my kids love it, and so if I give them five things to do every day, and, you know, your schoolwork is one of them, then they'll do it because they want to check it off so that they can have their free time. Because I'm like, once once this is done, that's your that's your responsibility for the day is to get these things taken care of. And so we don't um, we don't necessarily, like I said, I, you know, their math and language arts is more self-directed. And then we check it 
but we don't sit down with them and do it along the way because we want to see what they can do. And they love the fact that they can accomplish. And we go back and we say, oh, look, you did that right. They're like, <gasps> because they did it on their own. It wasn't us hovering over them. So, so giving them opportunities to really succeed. And um, you're, you're so right. My son said, Mom, could you put your calendar on my iPod so that I know exactly what we're doing? And I said, oh, my, no. <laughs> Because I don't stick to my calendar all the time. But but I found the same thing. If I say, okay, sometime this week we're going to do this, or sometime today we're going to do this, that that um, gives them that sense of security in knowing what's coming. Yeah. Well, one of my free content items on Wisdom Window mm -hmm. <laughs> is the family chunk clock. So um, there, let me say that people homeschool for a multitude of reasons, mm -hmm. and there's a ton of them. But bottom line, most parents just want their children to have a richer experience, whatever that experience looks like. And there is there is no way to homeschool. Right. I mean, there are as many ways to homeschool as there are parents. And really, if a parent is wise, they won't homeschool like their neighbor or the gal down the street. They'll look at their own family and say, what's going to work for us? Here's what I want to accomplish. How can I realistically do that in my family, the way my family functions? Mm -hmm. And and so I help parents sometimes figure that out, <laughs> how their family actually functions, what do their systems look like, mm -hmm. their systems by default even, you know, what do they look like and how can they can they make things work in their family. But um, whether or not you like lists, and I'm a huge list person, and I do love checking it off, and I'm one of those people who will write something I did on the list that wasn't on the list so I can check it off. <laughs> my mom said that very thing this morning. Yeah. <laughs> we so, you know, that's just my personality. But in a family, the truth is, if we're going to go by time or lists, most of the days we're going to go to bed feeling like somehow we failed because we... Families just, there are so many things that come up in a family. Sick children, tired children, crabby husbands, crabby moms, the car breaks down, the toast burns. I mean, things that put you off schedule constantly. Yeah. So there's an audio called The Family Chunk Clock with a PDF that my daughter came up with. And it, instead of having a list of tasks or time, you just turn your days into chunks of chunks and you give them really fun names and in each chunk there may be only one or two things that truly matter although there may be ten things you'd like to get done there's one maybe two things that really matter so that say for example you have a child who's sick all night and you get up two hours later than you planned you say where do I need to be mm -hmm. do I need to go back to this chunk or can I just move forward Right. And depending on what's in each chunk, it's it's a fabulous tool for a lot of families. It's been really successful for a lot of families. And it's free content. You know, take a look at it. If you're having trouble scheduling school or life in general, mm -hmm. that might really help you because part of the challenge is determining what really matters in a day. Mm -hmm. And we can get really caught up in all the goods and miss the, the best. That's very true. That's very true. So, so, all right. Well, what other you know juicy tips do you have for us? And then I want to talk specifically about the programs that you have available that are just really powerful resources for parents, whether they homeschool or not. You know, um, we're in summer right now, and a lot of parents are saying, "What on earth am I going to do with my kids for the summer?" And um, you know, I, I've been taking a look at at some of your content and thinking that's what I'm going to do with my kids for the summer. So, um, but, but first what, you know, what are some additional tips that you have for us? Well, one thing that I, I love talking about this. It's one of my favorite topics is um, sparks and a spark is anything that your child is interested in right now. So mm -hmm. I will give you a perfect example of a spark. So um, I have what's, called the Traveling Spark Station. It's a plastic basket, actually, and I go to my grandchildren once a week. Um, of course, now I live with them, but before, I would go to their house once a week with my little basket, and in it would be things that I thought might interest them. It mm -hmm. might be about germs. It could be about um, dragonflies or, you know, whatever, just 
I thought was interesting. Yeah. And so one day I went and I met Jack, my five-year-old grandson, at the gate, and I said, Jack, what do you think's in the spark traveling spark station today? And he said, elephants. And I said, no, we're going to talk about germs. And we had a wonderful time. <laughs> it was way fun. Then the next week when I went, I said, guess what we're going to do today? And he said, elephants. I said, no, today we're going to do patterns. Because it was a pre-map thing. And we had a wonderful time. The third week that I went, I said, guess what we're going to do today? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, elephants. <laughs> and he said, okay. Hmm. Because sparks are short-lived. A yeah. spark is a spark. Mm -hmm. And your children are telling you all the time what interests them. Of course, patterns, this pre-math stuff was really valuable for them. Mm -hmm. Learning about germs was really valuable. But learning about elephants is, zool I mean, is um, zoology. Mm -hmm. It's really important, too. And what if the second week when I had gone and I said, what do you think we're going to learn today? And he said, elephants. And I said, yes! Yeah. So when we did elephants, we had a wonderful time. I have beautiful pictures on my blog that um, show you know, what we did and how much fun we had. But can you imagine the week previous? Yeah. There just would have been a difference in the level of enthusiasm. Yeah. So I try to teach parents to watch for sparks. What do they look like? And here's the clue. If it bugs you, if you think it's gross, if it's going to involve you, and if it irritates you, that's probably the spark. <laughs> so I had a mom who sent me a wonderful email. She said, you know, my boys sit at the table and they burp every meal. And she said, we go round and round about it. And they laugh when anybody farts. And she said, they're just gross. And she said, one day I realized, oh, no, this is the spark. She said, I went to the library and, book, and I got every book on snot, gas, oh, no. vomit, she did every gross thing I could find, and there were plenty of books on them, and brought them home. She said for one whole month, she and her three boys, oldest one eight, she said we just had so much fun learning about how their bodies worked. She said we, we drew them on paper and we put their organs in and we traced how does, the, how does the fart go from the top to the bottom of oh, us. Oh, my word. And she said they just had a wonderful time. They learned a lot about anatomy. Mm -hmm. and how their bodies work. They had a wonderful time. And she said, we don't really have as much trouble with um, burping at the table anymore. So you're saying that what I need to do is my, smoothies, is my uh, that's my son's spark, and I right need now. to just give him recipes for smoothies, and we need, oh, I could so benefit from this. That's not yes, going to annoy could. me, though. <laughs> that's going to be awesome. <laughs> yes, and so... Uh, so I have, um, the spark station is really built on sparks. It's as simple as a plastic tub mm -hmm. where you put things that your kids are letting you know they're really interested in. Sometimes it can be something you're interested in and you hope it will spark them. But it's mm -hmm. really good if you start with something that they're excited about. And then you have a certain time when it's available. And it isn't available any other time. And I'm telling you, I had one dad, I, I worked with their family for three months, teaching them how to use the spark station. She was a preschool teacher for five years. She wow. said, I don't think you can teach me anything, but, you know, come. Mm. She was a pilot group for me. I just wanted to see how this would work. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the three months, uh, I got to interview all the kids and her and her husband, and he said, I'm amazed. It's like Christmas every day. Mm -hmm. So it's a great tool. And then... What is difficult for parents is um, coming up with information. I mean, yeah. there's a plethora of information out there, but it's the time to go on Google or wherever and get what you need. And so I created the Spark Rock and Spark Station idea packets, which mm -hmm. can be anywhere from 22 to 68 pages of activities, recipes, crafts, family events, on a topic. So whether you want to teach your kids about zoology or biology or um, the summer solstice or how to make cleaning fun. Mm -hmm. um, there are these wonderful packets and I try to pick things that really are sparky for kids. Mm -hmm. um, I observe a lot of kids. I'm, I do a lot of stuff with kids. Thousands of kids every year. And so I, I pay attention. I watch. You know, what are, what's, what is 
what are the sparks I'm getting from these kids and then that's how I design those packets or things I already know they're interested in. Perfect. And those are all up. I mean, those are all available on Wisdom yes. Window to download. And, and the cool thing is this, uh, these packets, there's one that's free. Oh, which one is the free one? The magnification. Oh. And there are activities for ages 2 to 12, basically 13, 14. Mm -hmm. um, on how magnification works, what it is, and fun things you can do with it, like you know, cook your hot dog for lunch with a Mag magnifying mm -hmm. glass, glass, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And that packet is free, so you can download it and try it out and say, oh, this was great, it really helped me out. Perfect. So you were you were telling me that there will be that you're going to be putting up some free audios on Wisdom Window that people will be able to have access to and download and, and just tips. There was one in particular that you were telling me about. So one of my favorite ones is change. Um, it's on change because most people I know are not satisfied with their way of being. Mm -hmm. how I am with my kids, how I am with my spouse, how I am with my mother-in-law, mm -hmm. how I am. And really good people want to improve. Sure. They do. And if people have learned not to be victims, I do a lot of mentoring on that, and how to take responsibility so their lives look more the way they want them to look, <clears throat> then they want to improve. It's just a natural thing. Mm -hmm. So why don't we? Because change is tough. And I believe one of the reasons it's tough is because you don't know what change looks like. Mm -hmm. And so I, this 30-some this, um, minute audio is about what change looks like. There are three basic steps to it, and the first one, frankly, looks flat out like failure. It looks like this. So you say, say you yell more than you want to. Yes. And um, <laughs> always <laughs> that's a common problem mm -hmm. for moms because parenting is tough, mm -hmm. life is tough. And so you say, okay, this is what we'll do. Say, I'm not going to yell anymore. Yeah, but we, we have no tools, no I'm plan. In the sand. That's yes. right. You know, I'm not going to. And then the next time you do, you you beat yourself up like, oh, I, I'm the worst. Ah. But this is what it should look like when you say, okay, I'm not going to yell anymore. And the next time you yell, you say, you realize you you don't want to do that. You shouldn't do that. That's the first step to success. Mm. That is the first step to actual change, is recognizing the error, feeling remorse about the error, and saying, okay, I'm going to do better next time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, but it looks like failure. And after we, and you will go through that, say, especially if you're talking about something big like, you know, taking control of your responses. And especially if you're toolless, you know, as you put out to the universe what you want, tools will come to you. You'll learn ways to do this because just saying you're not going to anymore, it's a little feeble. Yeah. It, that's just not a very good way to make it happen. But it's the beginning for a lot of people. So you are going to probably do it incorrectly six months to a year. Mm -hmm. And for six months to a year, every time you yell when you don't want to, and then you say, oh, okay, I should have done this instead. And if you understand that that's the first step to actual change, then you say, okay, I'm getting better. Okay, I recognize that. I'm going to do it. And the second step, basically, is when you, um, you are in the middle of yelling and you stop. Mm. You say, okay, let's talk about this. And then you go on a different track. That's the second step. And it will happen. Mm -hmm. If you can celebrate the first step, no matter how it looks or feels, You'll get to the second step, and the third step is when you go to yell, and you don't. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And so it's helpful to understand what this process looks like so we can celebrate the success that doesn't look like success so we can actually get to the second step. Because basically, if, we, if every time we do it incorrectly while we're learning, we beat ourselves up, we'll eventually quit. We'll That's feel true. worthless. We won't keep going. We'll stop. We'll go four or five more years, and then we'll try it again, and we'll go through that same failure process. Mm -hmm. So this um, audio is basically about change, what does it look like, and some tools to help you do it so you can be successful. Well, perfect. I love that um, all of your windows provide so many tools that people can implement right away and that they can go through and that are fun and exciting. And 
um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to download some of the free audios and to just listen to them. I'm always in a process of learning. So, um, you know, just to wrap up, what are some fun things that you're doing this summer for Sparks with your grandkids? Because I know that you work with your grandkids a lot. So what are some fun Sparks that you're working on? Well, you'd think I would have those all ahead, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. But what I decided to do is I thought I have put together, so right now we have 21 uh, packets. Mm -hmm. And I've never used them with my grandchildren. Wow. I know. I always come up with new stuff for them. So I thought, I'm going to start downloading my own packets mm -hmm. and um, doing what's in them. So I know one that they'll be really excited about right now. I have a, I have a couple of animal lovers. They just love animals, and so there's a zoology packet. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a number of zoology packets, but there, there's one called Zoology Wild Animals. Oh, perfect. And then the second thing we're going to do is Zoology Invertebrates, because they're so into bugs, and and we can find those so easily. So we're going to do a lot of zoology this summer. <laughs> perfect. I have an animal lover myself, so I'll go and check that one out, yeah, too. They're really fun. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here. I know I've already, I mean, you know, my mind is mentally cataloging, oh, step one, step two, step three, and um, sparks, and smoothies, and, you know, I've got all sorts of things running through my head. So I, you've really um, you've given me tremendous value today, and I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for coming. And, you know, are there any last words or last piece of advice you want to share with us? Yes, for you, actually. Oh, for me? Okay. So, sparks and smoothies. It's not enough just to give him recipes and let him make smoothies mm -hmm. because you're homeschooling. And so, have him create his own recipe book. Oh. Write the recipes down in his own handwriting. Label the sections for, let him label the sections, let him create his own recipe book. Great pride in creating something of your own that you can use then and have. So Give him measuring cups and then he writes down what it tastes like, whether he liked yeah, it or not. And oh, he, can, okay. he can have his own log book, which ones work, and maybe a section where he comes up with his own recipes and then he can say, did it taste good or not, did other people like it give him an opportunity to do some evaluation um, and some writing. So I'd say, you know, when we're working with children, the number one thing that keeps parents from not moving forward in these fun and exciting ways is we immediately have this thought, oh, it'll involve me. Mm. And we're busy. But isn't that why we had children in the first place? Yes to be involved with them and we do need to make time for them and so some of the busyness of our lives has to go so we have time to buy a notebook mm -hmm. and help a child make a recipe book so that's Perfect. my that's my final um, piece of counsel to parents is if you don't have time really for your children if you go to bed at night and think did we did I hug did I talk did we do anything today did I just yell? Then you're too busy. Mm -hmm. You need to simplify your life. You need to make room. Um, the greatest gift we give, not just to children but to anyone, is actual presence. I agree. When we clear our mind, even if it's just for three minutes at a time, for them. Mm -hmm. It makes a huge difference. Yep, well, thank you so much. I am so excited for um, all of the things that I can learn from Marianne. And, you know, I hope that you check out all of the free content and her Spark Station packets and take advantage of those. And have a an absolutely wonderful day. Enjoy the summer. It's so it's beautiful outside. Right. It's supposed to be 72 here in Salt Lake City this summer. Saturday. So oh, perfect. We don't even have to go to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm really excited for that. So thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.